This is Coda Radio, episode 65, for September 2nd, 2013. When you're listening to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode's brought to you by our two fine sponsors, GoDaddy.com and Ting.com. I'll tell you more about both those fine sponsors as the show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our excellent host on the East Coast, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Good morning. Hey, it's a holiday episode, Mr. Dominic. There are no holidays in self-employment land. I know, right? On the pre-show, you and I were uh, fully admitting that we had both sort of failed to realize today was Labor Day. Indeed. That is the plight of the self-employed, I think. Yes. And especially um, for us with this podcast, we have an international audience. So there's, you know, we're not all celebrating the same holiday. And then right. on top of that, most of the people actually download this show on Tuesdays. So for them, the holiday's over. And there's a bit of a disconnect there. So it's we just figured we would soldier on. Martian forward. <laughs> and we have kind of a grab bag episode. We're hoping to get some live calls. We've got the uh, Skype line open right now. People have sort of claimed they're going to call in. I've seen those claims made before, Michael, so we'll see if that actually plays you out. Know, but That reminds me when people claim they would buy like an Ubuntu laptop in the store. Uh, I feel like it's a lie. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> Oh, right. Positivity. I'm Whoa, sorry. Whoa, bam. It's like out of nowhere. Sigh. We, Ooh, we sigh. made it what? We made it, uh, we made it uh, two minutes into the show. <laughs> it's cleansing the karma. That's good. Cleansing That's good. You know, you get it out now. You get it out now, and then you're good for the rest of the day. It's kind of like in the morning when you drink a lot of coffee. Sometimes you... Never mind. Uh, so, I thought... As, really? <laughs> as is tradition, we should start with... The, we got some emails, some long emails. So we're going to read a couple of long emails. I'm hoping... Somebody gets off their butt and calls in and, and has something to talk to us about. And then let's roll into the grab bag. Uh, I got a couple topics. I want to follow up on uh, something we've talked about about a month ago. And uh, I also spent Friday at PAX. I went in as a media. So I got to go in before the floors opened. And I went down to the Indie Den, which is a, this, it was a new area. Before, they've always had the uh, Indie guys way up on the sixth floor and like very kind of out of the way away from all of the other big games and stuff now they're down on the main exhibition floor they've got like a they've got two rows dedicated just to indie developers quote unquote indie anybody from like literally a one-man shop to like you know some of the quasi not so indie shops uh but it was i had a good chat i talked to a lot of them and uh, I, i i i sussed out a really common thread that i'm not so sure how you're gonna feel about so i want to get your input on that so I think we're going to have fun for the holiday episode. Happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays, everybody. All right, well, uh, why don't we start with L feedback, should we? Now, you can email the show, coderadio at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And I want to get your opinion on this, Mr. Dominic. I was thinking about redoing the contact page on Jupiter Broadcasting. Now, brace yourself. I'm thinking of just essentially eliminating all means of contacting the shows except for the contact form and the subreddits. Like, no direct emailing, um, maybe bit message for some shows, but, like, uh, just eschewing. This show, that's pretty much the only methods as it is now, is, like... E- yeah, I don't think anybody emails directly anymore. Not much. I mean, it's, like, maybe one or two a week. Pretty much everybody's using the contact form, but I don't know. I was thinking about streamlining and making it a little easier. Um, I don't know. We'll see. So stay tuned. I might I might be redoing that page, but uh, all right. Uh, our first email this week comes in from Robert. Robert wrote in a mouthful here. Uh, He sends in, he says, uh, uh, our company has an inventory system through a software as a service provider. Uh, It has a way of running automated reports and can email the results either as text or HTML. Our email server is Exchange 2007. I have a free BSD server uh, that uh, handles my web-facing stuff. What I would like to do is pull the email from the Exchange server, parse the attachment in the email to MySQL, and then use a web page that generates reports and general info using SQL da- a SQL database. The part I'm having trouble with is obviously where to start. Specifically, um, what what can I use on FreeBSD or Linux that can pull the email? I read the attachment and load to SQL, and then lo- read the attachment and load it into SQL. 
I know PHP can do some of this, but I need it to happen automatically so the script would have it have to run on its own. Is Python or Ruby better for this? Server scripting, perhaps? I'm uh, just needing a nudge in the right direction because apparently my Google foo is lacking. I can find some examples of pieces, but I can't find enough parts to link the entire process together. This is a learning experience for me, so I just wanted to figure it out. I just kind of need a nudge. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and he asks, uh, he asks a question about the last chance to be a hero thing. Um, apparently he's not a Star Trek fan. That's all I'll say about that. So uh, do you have any insights on this, Mr. Dominic? Yeah, it's... Um you know, again, it's one of these situations where it's hard to give an answer over the air because it depends on their system, what they're trying to do, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Having said that, I feel like it doesn't matter whether he goes at Ruby or Python because it seems like he thinks one is going to be inherently better. Oh, right. Uh, um, I mean, I know a lot of folks would just use Python for this, and really, as long as you construct the script correctly, either, either solution is good. I, I feel like this is, I mean, what he's really talking about here is some fancy server admin scripts. I mean, you know, right. this is it's, kinda, it's not really developing a full scale yeah. app. It's, and, it's just, and for me, button. I tend to, I don't know, maybe this is bias on my part, but I tend to lean towards Python for that kind of job. I would even think this is a Python job, to be honest. Uh, if he, if you know, if you're equally knowledgeable in both, I would go with Python Yeah. for no reason whatsoever. Equally knowledgeable, either being none or some. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, well, especially if you're a server admin, uh, which I don't know that you are, but Python is kind of more used in that area. I'd love to hear from the chat room if they want to Skype in or leave us a note in the chat what they would recommend as the tools, because there's a lot of server side utilities you can use that will connect to an IMAP server and then do a dump. Um, you you know you could even you can even have depending on your oh he said it was Exchange. Um, uh, you lose some options, but you could still have an IMAP client. I was going to say there are some, uh, a lot of the open source packages will do some IMAP folder mirroring and things like that. And actually, if you don't have a lot of experience with either, the fact that Python is very batteries included will probably make it an easier um, you know, uptick for you. Yeah. 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 There you go, Robert. Good luck with that, sir. And uh, uh, Exchange 2007, damn. You know, if it was either if it was either a standard IMAP server or Exchange 2013, there's a lot of automated stuff you could just do at the server side level. But with 2007, you are going to kind of have to script the solution for yourself. All right, Mr. Dominic. Now, I was debating with you on the pre-show if maybe this was just tis the season. Uh, you know, the new school year uh, kind of ramped up recently. Uh, we've gotten another schooling question here, and I want to go ahead and read it. See if we can uh, solve the plight of uh, Mr. Ken here. He says, "Hi guys, love the show." I do, however, I have a small complaint, which wouldn't be such a big issue, but I hear this being repeated, and I feel I should launch my opinion on you fine gentlemen. I'm a student at UCB who has a programming gerb, and by gerb, he means job. Computer science, as you guys seem to describe it in terms of college work, must think that it's designed to teach programming. This is where you are wrong. CS is not a programming major. The concepts taught in CS help a lot with understanding the big ideas of many core-related computer topics. Calling CS a programming starter kit for people is like calling math arithmetic. Nothing could be further from the truth. Theory is taught in schools, then projects are designed to help increase problem-solving ability. Uh, I think... I think many students are disillusioned into thinking of the same thing you do, you guys do, which is that why students often feel unprepared out of college because they really don't have much programming experience. They should, however, be able to solve problems of many types. If someone wishes to be a software engineer and then they must, they must practice, taking CS in school will help gain a valuable insight into big areas of computing. Once this kind of person learns the syntax of a language, they should be able to pick things up quickly and be able to solve problems that people who only learn to code can't. Sorry to waste your time. Keep up the good work. Jim Kirk, USS Enterprise, out. That was awesome well, to hear from Jim Kirk. Uh, far be it for me to disagree with Captain Kirk. I would say that it's, you know, definitely factually true. And I don't think Chris or I ever said that CS degrees were designed to be programming training. In fact, I think that's our problem, at least for me. I think that's my issue with the CS degree. Um, the argument that, well, it teaches problem-solving skills, okay, so does ev you know, every other degree at a worthwhile school, right? I mean, critical thinking, problem-solving, communications, any four-year degree should give you some level of that where you're good enough to reason through most software development problems. Um, there are areas where the more math-based computer science side will be helpful, but they are much fewer and farther between, especially at that entry level, than you would think, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I would say, and I, I would wonder if you would agree with this, Chris, my issue isn't that it's not that type of program. It's that, you know, for whatever reasons, the students feel like it is, right? So they come out with their four-year CS degree and think they're actually decent developers. Um, when, when what they really learn... So you think it's like is, a false confidence? Well, you know, I've never said that there's no value in it. I've only said that what you've learned is not software engineering. Yeah. And not directly applicable skills. What I, right. And what the issue is that, you know, sure, we get a lot of writers who like to write in defending the CS degree, talking about big data and algorithms. But those developers are such a very, very small percentage of the whole community that, you know, the basic course being geared towards that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, for instance, most developers would probably never write their own uh you know, do anything with big data or anything that requires them to know you know, lower level systems or mathematics to any reasonable degree, anything beyond algebra, right? Do you think to, to does it at all does what he just read what I read there, does that to you and I'm not saying this is what it is, but does it seem a little bit to you like somebody who's bought a marketing pitch as to why it's worth spending your money to go into school? Well no. So what happens well, maybe, but we also get a lot of the people in, especially who are working on lower level, more more down to the hardware projects, right? When that stuff is of value. The thing to forget is the vast majority of developers are working in .NET and Java shops, you know, writing to APIs. Yeah. And that's all they're doing. And that's their entire gig. Right. For 20 years. Not so sexy. But it's not that it's not sexy, it's that I mean, it's practical, but I don't know it's if I call it. It's yeah. practical, and, and, that, and that's, I'll put it this way, we hammer, and especially some of our writers hammer on the on the students not knowing source control and things like that. Oh, yeah. I don't, yeah. Even, think, I don't even think that's the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem, especially with me seeing these resumes and these cover letters, is that, you know, they're not taught writing, right? In basic English. I mean, these are U.S. students, so English is, you know, the state language. Um, they can't what? stand up and talk to a group of people. They can't do oh, yeah. Yeah. a number of important, what you might consider soft skills. Because mm -hmm. you can teach anybody Java, right? But it's difficult to teach a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old proper English and how to write a proper report. It feels like that's something they should have learned at, at, uh, earlier in their schooling career, to be honest with you. Like, it doesn't seem like something Right, that... no, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know... College should be grammar school. I'm just saying that there definitely needs to be a focus on it, right? I'm being a little yeah. more well-rounded. Yeah, and having to... Because here's the other problem. You know, most students who come out with these degrees, let's say you were top of your class computer science, or, or worse, just below top of your class. So not good enough to get into Google, right? So you're you're thinking you're going to go to a company just as a developer because you pay, you have student loans, you need your job, right? Gotta get the monies. Well, if you interview with a guy who isn't from that background, who doesn't put a huge ton of uh, value on that mathematics side, and you can't carry on a 20-minute conversation, you're probably not going to get the job anyway. Because there's just not a lot of value in a lot of that lower-level stuff for the vast majority of software developers. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I know it's an unpopular thing, and I know... You know, particularly, well, and it's, I mean, I think it's particularly something that people who are passionate about self, who are self-taught and is passionate about digging into a topic, that's not what I want to spend my time learning, to be honest with you. That sounds like something I would figure out when I'm older that, oh, like that's probably something I need to, I need to now teach myself. But early on, I'm driven by my, I'm driven by just what I'm purely passionate about. Right. And it's. It's not writing. It's not speaking to groups. It's a hard thing for them to... Over I mean, I think your advice should be well considered by those folks who don't particularly like that type of stuff. It's your veggies, basically. Go well, eat your veggies, veggies, kids. Right? It's, <laughs> you know, there, there's this myth, and I think a lot of colleges kind of promote this, that you know the developers can chill in the basement and wear oh. Nintendo t-shirts yeah. and kind of you know, not talk to anybody, make the, make the secretary very uncomfortable, you know, kind of... Just power the Coke and tab and do that when, particularly in the areas I'm working in, modern day software developers, 
it, it's less and less about tech, right? It's more and more about the business stuff. You know, for instance, if, if you have a manager and you can understand why he's doing things the way he's doing them, which are probably money, right? It's probably about the business side. You're that much more valuable to the team. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you can point. shave, you know, in most projects, if you can shave, uh, you know, a tenth of a second off of a calculation, probably doesn't matter, right? Now, I know, like, every time we discuss this, we're going to get the exceptions from the folks doing the chip level design and things like that, and I get it. But right. there are so few of you. And less and less. Right. And every day, there are less of you. Now, we have our first caller. Should we see if uh, he's, still, he's still in line? Uh, caller, are you there? And where are you calling from? Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Um, I am calling from Georgia, the state in the United States. Um, right on, right on. I have a question not related at all to what you guys are talking about. But okay. um, well, I was having done. a conversation with my friend on how the difference between Android and iOS and how Android is inherently slower primarily because of the Java virtual machine. Oh, right on. Okay. That's, that's yep. the way I was thinking of it. Um, is there any way that Google, should they have the foresight to do so, um, decide to switch from a Java virtual machine to a um, system of compiled code? Um, something where like any app developer would even Java code and then release it to the app store and then Google on their side uh, compile it for every certain phone. And then when you download an app, you download your own binary and get rid of the Java virtual machine. Huh, that's altogether. interesting. I'm glad you brought this up, actually, because I spent the weekend on an iPhone 5 with iOS 7. And uh, so this is all kind of all of the animations and OS speed and all that kind of stuff is forefront in my mind right now. And uh, I, I, I would say, and I'll let Mr. Dominic answer the specific question, but it sounds like to me you're only solving one part of the speed problem on Android. What do you think, Michael? It's not practical. I mean, so one thing is it's not really the JVM, right? It's Davlik. Uh, Davlik? Davlik? You would say that wrong. But it, e even if it was doable and it wouldn't cause tremendous problems in the platform, which it probably would, think about the manpower required to do that, right? And now, how do you get all the manufacturers to then, you know, follow through on this change? And that is one of the biggest problems with Android, actually, right? Is that because of the lack of control, if Google were to do any kind of major shift, they couldn't really force it upon everyone. Well, I feel like with the Nexus 4, Google proved that if the manufacturers don't step up, they will take the market. Because I, How do you define take the market? I mean, if you, if you want to look at sales figures the Nexus 4 isn't that successful, right? Oh. It's only successful for people who would know to buy a Nexus. If you look at mom and pop and Joe Consumer, they're still buying the cheapest Android phone Verizon or AT&T will give them. Which are all mostly Samsungs. Which are all Samsungs. Well, and isn't it yeah. the truth, yeah. like in the case of games, there is a way to sort of talk specifically to the hardware run native code? You can use the NDK instead of the, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, so it sounds like what you're asking about is more the system animations, though, right? That to me now. Yeah. So isn't that what we really need? Don't we need Google? I mean, Google looked at Windows 95 and said, man, that GDI where we draw every single element on the screen every, over every time we refresh the whole screen line by line. Let's copy that model. I mean, so they've they've taken they instead of doing like an OpenGL environment that is rendered, they have uh, they do a they do a very fast dot matrix on the screen. And there is just a certain latency with that. I, the only way I can see to fix that, and they made a massive improvement with Project Butter, but the only way I can really see to improve it is to rip it out. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. But <laughs> Android 5.0, maybe Android 6. It's got to happen eventually, right? I'm expecting a lot from 5.0. It's supposed to come out when? October? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I, haven't, I Honestly, I haven't heard anything about a 5.0 yet. But well, I've, The only thing I heard about October was a Moto X Google edition. I mean, to be fair, what I've been hearing is that they're slowing down, not speeding up. That they're kind of stabilizing oh. on 4.3. It, it just, you know, and, and maybe it was just, uh, you know, that, that new shiny thing. But iOS 7 was so smooth and, like, people have been tugging on it. But after I used it for a little while, I was like, this is actually... For what you need in something that goes in your hand, it, the buttons were were much larger and much more easier and much more consistent than anything in Android. 
Uh, everything was much smoother. And and the the there are just a couple of gestures for like bringing up the bottom dashboard or bringing down the search that are uh, way better, way better. I mean, there's like I was I, I I am not a big fan of gesture support on a mobile device, especially right now the way they're done on uh, on Windows 8 and on Ubuntu Touch. However, iOS 7 they were I, it was obvious. Like I I it was like I, oh I need to search maybe oh yeah that's where it is. Like nobody had to tell me it just clicked and I I, I w- it was so smooth. It was a very 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 polished operating system and i think android's got like a lot better on the back end in terms of integration with cloud services and the play store integration and the way it handles updates and you know all the all the notification stuff's a lot nicer but if you could just sort of jazz up that interface and make it a little more modern it honestly feels like a really good theme sitting on top of yeah. a gtk with display you know it's like, and, like I, it, and I, have to, I have to be honest i actually uh disagree chris i i don't think android the more modern phones are that bad uh, they're not. Yes, they're they're it, almost they're to the point where you don't even notice it until you right. use the same applications on an iPhone, and then you see it, and then you don't unsee it. Well, one of my biggest complaints is that like I have a Galaxy S4, and every time I um, click on a text field for the keyboard to come up, it takes like half a second. Like that's a ridiculous amount of time in my eyes. Yeah, because that keyboard's its own big you know program that it has to load. Well, so keep yeah, in mind, I, if you're not using stock Android, there's also a bunch of crap running yeah, from the manufacturer in yeah, the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that, you know... that Yeah, the stock CPUs, Android keyboard's a lot yeah. faster, yeah. Those CPU cycles aren't free, right? I think Android is the better the better overall system. I like the way the applications can talk to each other better and all of that. But in terms of what I just need from a phone, from my cell phone, it's almost like iPhone, iPhone for the phone, Android for the tablet, which I think is maybe backwards the way most people see, see I'm it. I'm the opposite, yeah. yeah I... I I would go Android or Windows Phone for the phone and uh, iPad for the tablet just because the the applications yeah. aren't there on yeah. the other two. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see it. All right, we'll uh, call her from Georgia. Any other thoughts before we let you go? No, that's it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, man, have a great one. Thank Take you for calling happy in. Georgia. Happy Georgia. Happy Georgia. All right. <laughs> but Georgia sounds like a happy place to me. He seems it, happy. You know what? It probably is. And I bet they have uh, good food, too. That's what I think. They're big on peaches, right? Is that the thing? Because we have Jersey tomatoes and they yeah. have Georgia you know, peach. Do you know right? what we got up here in uh, Washington? Sadness and coffee. Wow. Ouch. Ouch. No, uh, we have, uh, well, we do have a lot of sad. You're right. Because of the seasonal affective disorder. Uh, right. But um, no, apples are big up here. And we got Walla Walla onions. I don't know if you've ever had a Walla Walla. I'm sorry. You have what? Apples. No, no, no. I got that one. Walla Walla onions. Walla Walla. Okay. So that doesn't go out that you guys don't have that over on the East Coast. Yeah. They're growing here. So that. that's not. Dude, they are. It's an, it's an onion that when they're just right, you could literally just pick it up and bite out of it like an apple. It's it makes the most incredible sautéed onions you've ever had. It is amazing. You know what else is amazing? Our first sponsor this this week, and that is Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. I was at uh, PAX. Oh, oh, we got a Skype caller. Hold on, on, Dasani. We'll answer your call, and then Dasani, we're going to get to you right after we talk about Ting. Thank you. Stand by, sir. So I was at uh, PAX this Friday, and uh, I was there with a guy that had an iPhone five running iOS seven. I was there with a guy who had an HTC One on another carrier, and I was there with a guy who had an Evo on another carrier. And one of the one of the fantastic things about my HTC One is it has this little uh, power saver profile that I put on there. I think I maybe I put it on there, but I got it with, with the Snapdragon app. You put that sucker in low power saving mode, and it shuts down like all of the extra radio, so you get ex- you get extended battery life out of the phone, so you know like you're not going to have it die on you because it's searching and trying to connect to all these different wireless networks. And then I'm able to go in there. I was able to get great call quality in the conference. The Ting signal in downtown Seattle was the most rock solid out of all of them. Uh, there was another guy there who had an Evo 4G with WiMAX. He was on the WiMAX the entire time, so when we needed to get out on the data... He was able to turn on his uh, hotspot, which comes built in with your Ting service. So when you sign up for a Ting account and you visit coderadio.ting.com to do that, you're able to you get you get hotspot and tethering included as part of it. Just just you just pay for what you use. You don't have to pay some sort of extra data tier or anything like that. It just comes with your plan. So this guy flips on his uh, his Evo's WiMAX, then he turns on the hotspot. Then the guys there all had DSs. This is the craziest thing I'd ever seen. All of these Nintendo 3DSs or whatever they are form a mesh network there at PAX and then start going out over this guy's 4G WiMAX on Ting. It was 
awesome. And they all start like getting all these points for like connecting to each other. If we essentially formed a mesh DS network right there on the floor of PAX, connected out over a Ting uh, YMAX connection. It was pretty awesome. And I had, so he was on, He w w what was awesome about that too is uh, I was on LTE. LTE was getting a little more beaten. There was more folks on the LTE band. Uh, so I was able to just switch my HTC one over to there, over to his and uh, we just rocked it. And he doesn't have to care because the way Ting works is you simply just pay for what you use. They add up at the end of the month, your minutes, your text, and your data, and then whatever bucket you just happen to fall into, that's what Ting bills you. And it's very clearly stated on their website. And they have a very easy to use dashboard. So you can monitor where you're at. And they also have apps for your device. So that way you can just launch the app right on your phone and see where you're at. The other great thing about Ting is it's just a flat $6 a month. So if you want to have multiple devices for testing and you don't use one very much one month, no big deal. You're not paying into some big contract that just sits there unused. You just simply pay for what you end up using. So you don't get that sort of gadget guilt that a lot of us have for having devices with data plans. Go to coderadio.ting.com. And uh, start saving. They have a little savings calculator right there where you can plug in your current bill. Average monthly bill on Ting is $21. That's not bad. Mine's actually lower than that on average. And uh, I've really been happy with the Ting service. And while you're over there, check out their Ting blog and be impressed by the transparency from a phone company. It's really encouraging. I know a lot of you as early adopters and people who are savvy about the products you buy, you like to get a little insight into the company. You like to follow what they're up to. Ting's been really great about putting that stuff right out there. Even if it's maybe slightly competitive information, I'd say. They're putting it right up there for you guys to check out. So go to coderadio.ting.com. And thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. All right, Mr. Dominic, we got Dasani on the line. Uh, Mr. Dasani, where are you calling in from? <laughs> um, calling in from St. Louis, uh, sorry, St. Louis City. You know, when I hear Dasani, mm -hmm. I think it's like a type of pizza. It's like Dasani. Hello? It's a Dasani pizza. Uh -oh. I think that'd be good. Wow. What what happened? Okay. No, you don't, guys. No. Okay, maybe not. Oh, what you, what's on your mind, sir? What are you calling for? Oh, good. You can't hear me. Okay, so I'm uh, just I w I called in to uh, talk about the the way education, um, the way we educate our computer science majors. I wanted to go back to that subject. Mm hmm. Um. The you're right that we don't we don't code uh, we don't train them for learning how to do problem solving unless that's a higher level for St. Louis University that was intro to object oriented design and really he just taught um, design patterns you know the Gang of Four book that was sort of what he what he focused on and then there was you know certain application classes where you had to write you had to make something by the end of the class so in databases we had to make something so a usable database okay. by the end of the class. now so this was like a like a practical lesson you had to follow right all right so where's your point in all of this oh well it's just that so so if we could teach math for example like we taught engineering then if you know if we, sorry if we taught math as an engineering course and we actually made people build stuff, people wouldn't hate math as much. Just like we teach or, or science mm. for that matter. Okay. Just because we make people do stuff and then it sinks in better. I think that's just... I just wish we would switch more to that. Also, that's... Yeah. The, the whole algorithms thing is, is something else you'd learn which, like you said, you're shaving off clock cycles is something you really shouldn't have to worry about. But... But yeah, um, all right, good to hear. Well, thank you for the perspective. Right. Good points. All right, sir. Well, thank you for calling. We appreciate it. See ya. See ya. There you go, folks. The uh, Skype line is open now. I'm gonna just leave it turned up. So if somebody calls in, it'll ring, and we can answer it if we want to. Uh, but you know, that's fine. That's fine. So, anyways, uh, I, I I have a couple of topics I'd like to toss your way, unless there's something you want to start with. Well, I just have one little note. Uh, the Ting apparently has the red HTC One now. Oh, red! You know, then that's a yeah. good looking red too. That is good looking. I'm having a little buyer's remorse over my white one because, damn. What did you think of the black one when that came out? You know, I I saw it in a store. I didn't like it. Yeah, I was like, I could pass yeah. that one, but the red one actually looks the red really, looks stunning, and it's and like a good they, red. They have the purple HTC Eight X, which is. All right. Honest question. Mm -hmm. Moto X wood. Would you do it? Would you get wood? Oh, you mean the wood, the wood finish? Yeah, they got the wood finish on the Moto X. Because I'm going to tell you, I kind of want that. <laughs> come no. On, come on, dude. A wood cell phone? That sounds awesome. 
I don't think I'd do that. I know. I think if Tango had a Moto X, I'd probably get it. Uh, well, you never know. Uh, they have an active user form where uh, people are speculating about that very thing right now. Yeah. As well but- as some other phones that people may be looking forward to in the next couple of weeks that people are speculating about. Uh, so um, I want to just talk about the Ouya real quick. So uh, can, I, can we just declare uh, the state of Ouya to be a fail state? And I hate to be so harsh about it, but I was at PAX this weekend. Mm-hmm. Nobody I talked to had any interest in writing for the Ouya. Ouya was not there. Uh, some people who were developers hadn't even heard of it. And now I've got a, an article over at Gamestra.com, the trials for Ouya porting using mono game. And they talk about the difficulty they've had just trying to get yep. um, mono, game game, mono game written apps built and working on the Ouya. Um, yeah. You know, they say they, they've designed all their games to run at 720p, but the Ouya is up them to 1080p, so their graphics don't look very good, and they'd prefer that it did like a mode switch. And they go on to say that's just like the beginning of it because they have frame rate issues. I mean, the whole thing is like... They say overall it's been a frustrating process porting my game, which is still not done, that has taken much longer than I thought had ho- and hoped. A second or third game ported, though, I expect to be pretty quick as I've worked through many of these issues... And it sounds like maybe a big part of his problem is he went with uh, uh, mono game. I don't know, but he's like, I don't. Then he says, after all of this, I don't know if anyone's going to buy my game. I spent the first day of my time on this project just installing things like newer versions of mono games, a Marion and Android SDK. Out of the box, I'd have to say ninety percent of my game worked after it was deployed, but then the rest of it was all spent on that last closing the gap. Yeah. Um, and it's all he says. And at the end, he says it's all for kind of an unknown investment. So I actually read the same article. Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't know how productive a conversation this is, right? Because it's 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 dead, right? It's a dead platform. I mean, the Ouya is just it's just not going anywhere. So, I guess maybe what I'd like to do is, I get I guess my question: Do you think at this point is this is just too locked down, or was it an execution failure? Is it that the do, Ouya? Do I think the platform's too closed? No, I mean, is the market too locked down by the big incumbents? Well, I mean, are we, are we never going to see a indie, an indie-friendly challenger arise to face up against the PlayStation and the Xbox? Well, if you think about it Nintendo. from the perspective of a you know a game developer with limited resources, would you rather be on this unproven platform from this brand new company, or would you rather be on something you know the Xbox or the PlayStation that has name recognition? Well, I feel like that's kind of a false choice because I think in most cases these developers don't even have the option of being on on one of those platforms. Whereas the Ouya sort of brought that option to the table. Well, and that's how, do you, what, how do you mean? I think it, they do have the choice on both now. No, I mean, well, well, first of all, we don't really know what the details are to get on on there, right? I mean, we don't really know. Like if you if if you're making the next great platformer and you've got you know a great look to it and music. There's a good shot you're going to get on there, but you don't know for sure. It's still a gamble. So, Just like you don't know if you're going to get accepted into App Store. Apple could reject your app. You never know. I mean, right. all of these have this inherent unknown where where something like Ouya, uh, where a little more open of a marketplace, or even maybe a better example, Android, um, you know, that sort of risk is removed. And and I'm just saying there's not that opportunity in the console space right so now. So it's actually very interesting, right? Because we went from a position of knowing nothing about the one or that the one was going to be, I hate that name, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the Xbox, better name, was going to be, you know, closed. Well, now we know a lot about the Xbox, and it's fairly close to the Apple model, right? In fact, it's, you know, it seems like it's going to be just like an RT app. Um, we don't know a lot about Sony, other than big, high-minded ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I, you know, Microsoft has already shared their pricing model, so it, it's not that much of an unknown i mean you're right there's the same risk as apple they could just reject you but i don't well and i just i guess maybe i'm more of a uh oh wait hold on let me let me do this right stand by hold on curmudgeon i'm more of a curmudgeon about microsoft than you are uh i just because Microsoft says one thing doesn't mean that's what's actually going to happen at all. I mean, it might even be, I would like, if, if we sat here when the X, when the X bone launches and we're like, Oh yeah, yeah. They're punting on the whole indie thing for six months would not surprise me at all. Like not a shock at all because they're, it was vague. It was not specific. It was like, yeah, they're going to be placed right alongside regular titles. They're not going to be a second class citizen. Right, and there's going to be an approval process. Now. I mean, they, that's they, not specific. They've added. You don't know what it would, you don't, but you don't know. Like, if you're going to make the app today, you don't know. Like, you don't know, like, if when they're going to start taking and accepting apps, you don't know what that right. process, so or if they've even created that. that process yet. Yeah. 
So maybe we should just go over what we know from both, because I think it's going to be really confusing for people listening. Um, Microsoft has opened something called the ID program, which is the thing I always hate with these app stores, right? It's favoritism. Yes, anybody can submit an app, but you know some people are a little more equal, right? Some people get first uh, first access. Is mm-hmm. that fair? Mm-hmm. But Sony has the same system. Mm-hmm. They've just been doing it in closed doors, emailing and calling people. Well, they want to, yeah, they want to have like some nice, you know, apps. Well, and that, and that's, I mean, you know, I almost feel like, I mean, I, what do you want? I guess is my question. Do you want, I mean, are you just saying that you don't like these? It sounds like you don't like app stores in general. I, no, I, I think that the Microsofts and the Sonys are always going to be more geared towards the big commercial. established brands. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The Ouya offered an opportunity for, you know, like someone in but our they audience didn't, is right? to decide. They, they, they offered an opportunity to build the next great platform or, oh, but we're also going to allow emulators. So that they, 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 they were trying to be everything to everyone, right? They were trying to be this great revenue generator for small de- developers. Yeah. Yeah. But this wonderful emulation box for cheap people. Uh, they at one point they were pushing the uh, what's it, uh, Xbox Media Server crap. I mean, not that any of those things mm. are bad necessarily, but they weren't focused, right? You you can't be everything to everyone. And also, the way they forced your game to have some sort of free trial kind of led to a lot of predatory stuff. For instance, I was playing an eight bit style game, and I'm like, all right, let me let me buy this. Sure, they gave you part of the game up front, but then the game was like thirty bucks because they knew they were going to get a low conversion rate because they were forced to do a demo and they wanted to make it back. Yeah, yeah. I mean... So it is locked down, is what you're saying. Wait, the market, know, I, the I, market is not... I hate to use this word, but it's kind of schizophrenic, right? You can't be both a great platform for proprietary software to generate revenue for these small companies, oh, and this bastion of openness. Hmm? This is kind of the Google problem. Maybe, yeah. You're open until you need to make money, and then you shut down. Hmm. I mean, and, and I guess it's different, right? Because you know, there's an age gap between us, and also Microsoft sure was evil when I was coming up. But it, you know, this is the way these app stores are run. So it's kind of, you know, I bitch about Apple and the way they're unfair and the way they play favorites. But you know, so does Google. I mean, Google just does it in a different way. They let everybody in. But then, you know, if you're someone they want, they'll tap you on the shoulder and feature you. So does Microsoft. So does Sony. Yeah. And I'm sure when Nintendo figures out what the hell they're doing, they'll be doing the same thing. So while we're talking about games, why don't I talk about uh, my trip to PAX? You went to PAX? Yeah, I went to PAX. And I went down to the Indie Den. And And you didn't invite me. Interesting. Well, I can't. I probably shouldn't go into full details of how I got into PAX because I don't want to get my co-host from Unfiltered Chase in trouble. But... uh, it was sort of a last-minute arrangement, and uh, uh-huh. I did sneak in. That's a fair to say. That is a fair way to put it. I'd say it doesn't uh, doesn't give away too much. And uh, but I, I knew I, I made a beeline for the indie den because those were my Linux compadres, right? And I knew I needed to go for down sure. there talk to them. T- I was mainly trying to get a sense of their Linux temperature, which was overall quite positive. But can you guess why it was overall quite positive? In fact, the reason why I didn't get more interviews for last is because they all kind of just said the same thing. They don't know what the platform vendors are doing. No, it's Unity. It's Unity. Unity. They, they're all talking about Unity, and and Unity Two D was a was making a stink with them. But um, a lot of them are saying, you know, it really works. We published Linux, and then we we have we have to do separate amount of testing. You know, there's there's a sure. separate set of QA that goes involved. But like, we are actually just clicking buttons and publishing Linux versions. And I asked, you know, what kind of response are they getting? They're saying, you know, uh, like uh, I was talking to uh, Guns of Icarus online. And they were saying two to three percent of their uh, base right now is Linux, but it's only been on Steam for Linux like, for like a month, so that's not bad. Right. Um, yeah, so I was impressed. They they all no, they I, all had pretty I, good things to say about Unity. Not everybody's using it, but everybody had kind of good things to say. I have a confession to make. Unity 2D has, and that's what I'm calling it, even though they're not, has uh, sparked some discussions here in Eaton Town. So, can you explain to me what Unity 2D is? Do you know? It's still Unity. But it's, uh, okay, so what has been happening is, you know, I, I think everybody knows 3D games are more expensive to develop than 2D games. And for a lot of things, you don't want to go 3D anyway. 
so a lot of developers have been kind of jerry-rigging 2D tools on top of Unity. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Which works. But whenever you're using a tool in a way it wasn't designed, you're kind of rolling the dice, right? Yep. So what Unity has done is acknowledge this large community, and they've made their own 2D tools that they promise to support. Uh, so anybody who's familiar with Unity will know that they have the scene builder, right? Well, now there's a 2D scene builder that works. For like making very, an application. I mean, kind of, right? Okay. It's very similar to the 3D one, but... Okay, so it's still meant for games. Right, this isn't a separate program right now. This is Well, right now it's all beta, so things could change, but... It's for making games. It's for a two D physics engine, right? It's optimized for two D, right? I mean that that's the bottom line. It's platformers, optimized for, that kind of stuff, right? There's an optimized sprite engine you can use. It's really like I think of uh, Rockhard, Rockhard, Rockhard. Uh, that was a really mm. fun platformer, mostly two D, done in Unity. And I really yeah, love the that, heck that out game of that game. Would probably still be done. in with the 3D tool set, though. Yeah, okay. I mean, when we were thinking Unity 2D, think like Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, so real yeah. flat. Real 2D, right? Like, yeah. No, yeah, Rock I mean, had depth to it and stuff like right. that. Right, you could do perspective in 2.5D. I mean, to be fair, you know, I had no early access to this, right? I found out about this when everybody else did. So I haven't had a chance to download them or use the 2D tools yet. Um, I can tell you that it's being actively discussed. Hmm. And I feel bad for any company who was selling a 2D game engine. Mm, yeah, I mean, they were all, I mean, like, honestly. Well, the way, the way this looks like um, from the press release is that if you've already paid for Unity, you've already paid for this. Yeah. Steam uh, was the other big thing, really. All those guys down there were talking about Steam. I mean, it is, it is like, they uh, either they they're on green light or they uh, in the case of uh, a game I uh, it looks really interesting called Forced. Um, they're now doing that Steam early access where you buy right. into the beta and uh, you have to get into the beta program and then you get the game yeah. and you own the game, but it's like the pre-release version of the game and you're also kind of at the same time kickstarting it. So that's it's interesting to see how Steam's kind of filling in, and I guess that's to bring this conversation back to the consoles thing why I still think Steam should do the Steam box. And I know you're kind of a poo-pooer on it, but I was down there talking to these guys, and they're all already on it. And in the case of, they're all talking about Unity, and now Unity is going to make an, I mean, it just, gosh, it just seems like all the pieces are there for a Steam box. You got distribution, you got big picture mode, you got Unity. Yeah. Ah. Well, I'll be honest, from a dev perspective, you know, the PC, and I mean that in a very general way of the personal computer, not, not necessarily the Windows PC, is probably the most attractive platform because it's the least friction, right? Oh, we got a call from Eric. Let's bring him in. So, uh, hey, Eric, hey, Eric where are you calling from? Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Hi there. Hi there. So this is uh, Eric has now been outed as uh, Heaven's Revenge in the chat room. Boom. We got him. We got him right yeah. in our sights. So what's going on? Well, I was going to say hello and tell you what I'm thinking and concerning. You know, console you know, situation. All right, late on us. Well, you guys are aware that uh, Microsoft is pretty much going straight up Azure. And, you know, Google is all for their cloud stuff and Chrome OS. Also, NVIDIA is doing a lot of stuff concerning, you know, streaming video encoding and doing hardware video decode. You gotta make your you gotta make your point quick, Eric, because you're sounding like you're calling from a bathtub. Ah, oh, sorry. It's all I right. Imagine, oh, I imagine everything is gonna go from local to distant streaming games, and yeah, even sort of like the on live will just be kind of like built into everything. Yeah, same thing as Xbox Live can be hosted. You know. Yeah, they're doing that in the one right. They're having like some of the game processing done on the Microsoft Cloud. Yeah, and you just buy a subscription. Yeah. And they send you the entire game. That's why I think the web browser is going to replace everything. Because if if you can get even like seventy a seventy percent OUYA solution, or I'm not OUYA, I'm sorry, on live, oh. where uh, you have cloud GPUs and they're rendering it and they're streaming it back as maybe a super efficient video codec in their case HD sixty four, but it could be anything. Uh, then you could really start talking about gaming in a web browser and full fledged games on tablets and devices like the OUYA. Um, the shield has already started, but. 
So, so uh, the shield is using cloud rendering for some of the games on it. It's you're using your local computer to render and play the games, and then send it streaming wireless to the little shield. So it like connects to your machine over the LAN. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And it actually runs and plays and renders on your local or powerful rigs that you have the CPU. Huh. It does the process, it sends it to the shield, and you control it. Oh, well, your Skype call's getting weird again, so I'm going to let you go. But that was very interesting. Thank you for the insight. I did not know that about the Shield. People have been in the chat room have been mentioning the Shield uh, during the episode, and I just, I don't know. I have not clicked into the NVIDIA Shield. I just kind of, I feel like the world does not need the Shield. But maybe the Shield is the hero yeah. I didn't know we needed. Is it the hero we deserve? Is that what you're going to <laughs> That's where I was going. You got it. Uh, so okay, Harvey. Anyways. I guess we can just wrap up that. that well, we'll just put a pin in that conversation where we're saying uh, makes me bullish about a Steam box, but Valve has pulled back on the whole Steam box thing, like way, way back. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I guess it's it's uh, kind of up in the air now because they kind of laid off some of the people working on that project, yeah. like Jerry Ellsworth. Well, all right, we got our second caller. Hey, Jan, what's going on? Whoa. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, good. What's going on, man? Um, I would like to talk about uh, JavaScript. Um, right now, JavaScript is the hotness, and everybody seems to be hyped about it, but I don't think it will be long-lived. There has to be something to replace it, and my question is, do you think uh, Google Dart is, is a way to go in the future? Good question. All right, so you think, even though JavaScript is being used at, 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 at way more than it ever has between all of Google's products the GNOME desktop, and all of these things, you think JavaScript is coming to an end soon? It seems like it's, I mean, on, an, it seems like it's on a rocket ascent to me. Right now, it's, JavaScript is great. Everybody's doing it, right? <laughs> but eventually, <laughs> I think uh, the web will progress, and it will require more uh, in terms of performance and uh, capabilities. Okay. And I think JavaScript will hit the, the wall what about Beyond the it, what about the argument that you're seeing these? Well, I mean, I can look at you, this argument. I think held up really well pre Chrome and pre WebKit, but now we're looking at uh, you know these these JavaScript engines and these browsers that are multi core supported. They they I mean they really they've really gotten faster. So do you think maybe that problem is just going to be solved by technology? Well, maybe if if someone. If, if JavaScript evolves in future, if, if new versions of ECMAScript evolve, uh, as well as if, if all of the browsers get some kind of new engine, which would support a lot of access to, to like lower level hardware, to be able to do things like OpenCL or, or access uh, CMD extensions and, and gain a lot of performance boost, maybe redesign the language a little bit to, to, to be easier to optimize in real time then then maybe but as far as as the state of it now it's like really fast for doing for doing things um, as as you know client side things as yeah. in web applications yeah but it's not performant enough to do anything more serious All right. anything All that right. could be a replacement for for native client uh, application I want to hear uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Dominic's thoughts on this Yeah I guess I have a different perspective uh in, you know, in our larger JavaScript projects, the issue is never, was rarely performance. Um, it's usually that JavaScript, because of the way, just you know, the qualities of the language, is difficult to keep organized, right? Difficult to keep clean. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar. Code rot over time that becomes a main problem. It, bit, it seems to bit rot a lot bit faster. Rot, yeah. Than the, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you could be right, but I would almost argue that. You know, it's a lot easier to change to keep optimizing V8 and the other engines rather than change the language. Um, I think, at least right now, the you know the alternatives that we see CoffeeScript, um, TypeScript, and Dart are really more focused on easing the development experience, right? Making it more similar to, well, again, getting back to our college thing, what people are taught in school, more classical C style languages like Java. But, I mean, if you're right, you know, it's a weird situation where if they're going to go ahead and try to replace JavaScript or do something else, they can try. And they could, you know, they could definitely do something that includes static typing. Hmm. But again, it, I don't see it going anywhere. 
I, I think the best case scenario will be something that just compiles into it. Interesting. All right, Jam. Well, thank you for calling in, sir. We appreciate uh, the insight and good discussion. That leaves the line open. If you'd like to call in and chat with Mike and I on any topic, it's an open line. It is our holiday grab bag episode. And uh, while we are waiting for our next call, I want to stop and thank our second and final sponsor for this week's episode of the Coda Radio Program, and that is GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy.com, of course, the world's number one domain name registrar, has some exciting things coming up. If you have clients, if you have a job where you're registering domains for somebody else or for a group of people, you need to use GoDaddy. It's the responsible thing to do because it is sort of the industry standard. Now, let me tell you something. If later on down the road, life moves on, you need to walk away, GoDaddy has a very easy way to transfer rights to accounts. You can also set up sub-accounts and give people access to certain folders. It's great for working in group environments. It's great for a small team or a medium team or because they are the world's number one, a large team. And if you use the link in our show notes, you get GoDaddy's new Express Pathway. Boom, get you right in. You check out what you want. Pow, you're out. Laser focused, as I like to call it. And that link in the Coder Radio show notes also pre-tags you for Coder 249. Coder 249 gets you a .com for $2.49. That's like internet real estate for less than the price of a good app. It's crazy. Coder 249. You use the link. You get the Express Pathway. If you don't use the link, just go to GoDaddy and use our code Coder 249 when you check out and get that .com for $2.49. And thanks to GoDaddy for the longtime sponsorship of the Coder Radio Program. Thanks to you guys for supporting our sponsors. And if you register something really cool with our Coder 249 code, mention it in one of your emails to us so we can check it out. Maybe we'll show it on a future episode of Coder Radio. Thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Coder Radio Program. All right, Mr. Dominic, that uh, leaves us within the last few minutes of our show. The line is open if anybody wants to Skype us, um, and uh, we can we can take their calls, we can take their questions, their trials, their tribulations. Tribulations, yeah. hatred of JavaScript, yeah. Oh, I, had, I had a kind of a question for you, unless you had another topic you wanted to jump on. No, no, let's go. Oh, David's calling. Well, we'll answer David's call. And then I got, and then I got a question about, uh, you know, um, I don't know if entertainment while you're coding is the right thing to call, but like, you know, your background distractions. So think sure, about sure, that. Sure, sure. So David, are you with us? I hear David's Let's see, what are we hearing there? Yeah, I hear his fan. Can you hear me? Uh you're pretty rough, man. I think you've got some uh, USB audio issues or you must be coming over an analog. Oh yeah, that's bad. That's bad. Try calling the uh, Skype call testing lady and hear what you sound like. You kinda sound like you're in a vacuum. And uh you might just need to hook up a USB interface. Try again, David. We'll uh, get you on. One of these days will be a fancy operation with call screeners and all the like. We're working on, so you might have seen during the show, people are talking about the mumble chat room a lot, which we set up for Linux Unplugged. And in that setup, we're going to have a screening room. So people will go in there, we'll, they'll, make, you'll do a, they'll do a mic check, topic check, and then they'll get moved into the on-air screen where they can uh, chat with us. So I'm professional. Uh, yeah, it, the mumble room is going to be cool, but that's not yet because we might be transitioning servers and stuff like that, so we're not quite ready. So my question was going to be for you. I have found... Especially like when I'm doing show research on a topic and like writing up like a notes on how to do something. Uh, I, I, to me, it helps to have like an old episode of Star Trek playing or something in the mm -hmm. background. Have you, what do you, do you get, do you have like this line where you can watch something kind of secondarily and continue to work or are you music only? I have only? a list. Yeah. I have a list of programs that I can watch in order. Stargate SG-1, top shelf, MI5, a recent addition, but pretty good. Uh, Doctor Who, Torchwood, and uh, last but certainly not least, that other British show whose name I forgot. Uh, like, um, the hell's the other show? What's it about? I don't remember. Is it Sherlock? Sherlock. Good one. Uh, Sherlock sometimes can be tough because I get distracted by it. So that was what I was going to ask you, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. for me, it's like stuff I'm like super familiar with. Well, so that's why, yeah. So I've, I think I've seen the entirety of Stargate SG-1 at least 400 times. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm probably like that with TNG. Star Trek TNG. Again, I watch that. The problem is I only watch that maybe once every couple of years. So I kind of, as soon as the Borg show up, I'm like, hey, what's up? Yeah, that's always good. Yeah, yeah it's season three, end of season three. That's yep. good. Yeah. Uh, I, I also have been rewatching uh, Voyager recently, and now I'm rewatching bits of DS9. And I've been doing it like, it sounds, it's just, it's not like I'm actually actively watching it. It's like I'll have it up in a window on my second screen while I'm working. And I find it to be really relaxing. Same here. Yeah, I have, a, I have a screen right next to my desk, at home at least. Yeah. So it's interesting because Voyager dis distracts me a little more. Because it's so disappointing? 
Wait, is Voyager Janeway or is yeah, that yeah, that's yeah. Janeway. Get off my you don't ship. Like, you don't like? I like her. I think she's Janeway is not too bad. Other than uh, you know, um, I, I I mean, I could make a whole. I've actually, I have so many problems with Voyager that I've actually considered making like a limited run podcast out of it. Um, because things you hate, yeah. Wow. And I would just go through like uh like six episodes and just just like. I, I think I could find six or seven defining episodes of Voyager that totally condemn Voyager as a failed show. Um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll do that one day. So Voyager, I don't always watch. I have been recently oh, okay. just to see like I've about every year or so I rewatch it to see if it's as bad. Like I need to sort of self check myself. Am I really, does it really deserve this? And uh, I've now reentered the phase where yes, it, it does deserve that. <laughs> It was like last week. I was like, no, nah, it's not so bad. You know, it's not that so bad. That was a little more vitriol than I thought we'd get. Uh, yeah. Well, so my point is I'm now kind of switching to music. I'm going, I've kind of switching back to music and I find it actually to, to be a little better because I kind of get in a groove more. I think yeah. music's actually more beneficial for productivity than watching something. Yeah, I, I use music sometimes too. The, the problem is, you know, I find bubblegum pop very effective. Mm. But then Which you feel bad for listening to it. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. I have to keep going into Spotify, making sure it's not linked to a Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to double check that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got So um, when Dylan was brand new baby and uh, was not sleeping, there was a couple of, uh, it was it was like a Mariah Carey song. It was like one specific Mariah Carey song that he Always would- Always be my baby. Yeah. He would stop crying. And so I was playing it over and over again on Spotify. And then si- finally somebody's like, so I noticed on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, F. Yep. No, I'm not a Mariah Carey fanatic. Broadway uh, works too. Uh, actually, the Les Mis soundtrack is pretty good for, for bug fixing. Sometimes like when, I, when I'm like, when I, I think like when I want a palate cleanse, I'll do podcasts too. That's like- Yeah, it, well, yeah. I, I work a lot with podcasts. Yeah. Um, for like business admin stuff, stuff that's not really taxing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But just you know, like enter, ex, I'm sure you know, spreadsheets are an unfortunate part of life. Yeah. Um, oh, Tron Legacy, great album for yep. for kicking off a new project. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, so um, Re- really, I, nothing you know, nothing helps me solve a bug better than watching uh, SG Six get killed over and over again. And anybody who knows Stargate will know that for some reason that team dies every time. So I got a new toy this weekend at PAX, and uh, it is a handheld console that kind of reminds me of like the Game Boy Advance. I talked about it in last on Sunday. It's a totally open platform now. It's definitely targeted more at retro platformer games. It runs Linux, and uh, you just connect it to your Wi-Fi and then just upload games to it. And they've got a kind of an open development community kind of forming up around this this sort of breed of platform uh it's it's lighter than a ds i'm holding it right now in my hands it's got good buttons it's got um a pretty bright screen it's a low res screen but it, that's what it's supposed to be um it's so it's called the gcw zero it was a kickstarter project initially they got like over their funding and then they shipped and now it's a product you can get and they're showing it off there and like right now i've got like doom on here retro games right who do you think of these kind of things what are your what is your uh what is your Michael Dominic assessment of? of is, do you think it's just a fun toy? Do you think it might actually take off? Uh, I'm gonna go with fun toy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for maybe a niche. Yeah, I, I hate to say it. You know, at first I thought you were gonna tell me you got a 2DS. To be honest with you, I actually kind of thought about it, but if they needed to, they need to lower that price, and then yeah, no, nah, I thought nah. Then, I, then that was just long enough for me to go ah, nah, forget it. I mean, if you think about it, it's great that all these small devices, all these you know, unique little devices, are being made, and and hopefully they at least some of them can be viable in a, from a business perspective. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, competition's good, and you know, think about Android phones, right? I think the HTC One is probably the best phone on the market right now, but somebody else might say you're nuts. It's the Galaxy, or you're nuts. It's right. the Nexus. Yeah, right? yeah, oh yeah, yeah. A variety is definitely good, and. With tools like Unity, it's becoming, it's not trivial yet, but it's becoming easier to port to these different devices with less effort, mm-hmm. you know, than it would be in the past. That's a very wishy-washy response. No, it's, it's like, maybe the market is big enough to sustain a small little device like that for a small niche. Maybe. Right, if it, if it can just be careful not to, you know... I mean, what is it based? Is it's Linux based, but yeah. is it really Android based? Or? No, no, no. It's its own distro of Linux. It's like a full yeah. legit Linux, and the performance is—it's really snappy, right? Um, and everything loads pretty quick, 
And it's, you know, in the box, too, came with an HDMI cable, came with uh, analog TV out, came with oh, uh, wow. everything. Everything was in oh. the box, including a little pouch, because they they met some of their uh, stretch goals on the Kickstarter. Uh, and it came loaded with about a half a dozen or so, maybe maybe a little more games. And then you go to their site, and they have uh, a lot of ROMs, you know, as but this is sort of like the perfect little retro ROM device. Um, it's kind of like ideal because it's you can get the SNES emulators and the Sega emulators and the Commodore, all that stuff on there, and and then you've got this, the analog controls. No, I mean it's good if, if if all these devices can stay in production and and not have uh, you know there's nothing worse than you buy a niche device and then the company goes under and you get no support and eventually it just bit rots to death. Right? Yeah, yeah, and that's the only kind of reservation. I think, yeah, I think this, I think what's interesting is it's going to be a new class where it's, it's for a small community, maintained by a small community, and it survives off that small community. And maybe when they do their next model, they'll do another Kickstarter. And that one, that's how they, so they fund the next edition via the community. Could be. Could be a small little ecosystem that just sustains itself. I wonder. Is it yeah, possible? I, I think we're going to see a few of these devices be successful, which is going to hurt Nintendo in particular. Mm-hmm. You're right but I don't. That. I don't think we're gonna. You know, I don't. I think the market's big. I don't think it's big enough to sustain like twenty of them, right? I, I think we'll have couple, less than ten. Yeah, a couple at best, probably. Yeah, yeah. especially and with I the feeling, tablets. I have a feeling they'll be Android based. Mm. But maybe we'll see. All right, Mister Dominic. Well, I think we'll wrap it right there. Unless there's, I think that's a wrap. Yeah. That is our holiday grab bag edition of the Coder Radio program. Don't forget, you can email us Coder Radio. Can I just see you next week? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, anyone who's interested in Docker should definitely tune in live next. Oh week. yeah, we're gonna have a great chat next week. I'd yep. love to get. Yeah, we have uh, some folks on. We're gonna have uh, one guy from the Docker Project on, and yeah. uh, I think that'll be a good chat. All right. Well, so uh, send in your Docker questions too. Hit that contact link or uh, find Mr. Dominic via his social network links and his website linked in the show notes, as well as our subreddit over at coderadio.reddit.com. Don't forget you can join us Mondays 9 a.m. noon Eastern over at jblive.tv. All right, Mr. Dominic, you have yourself a fantastic week. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>